Greetings, Columbia. My name is Adam Brown, and I'm the program director of Solaire, the Science of Learning Research Initiative. If you're not familiar with Solaire, we are a sort of sibling of the CTL within the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Innovation, which is part of the Provost Office here at Columbia. And we are specifically focused on conducting formal scientific research to investigate questions about teaching and learning, especially as it happens in courses at Columbia. And like everyone else uh, in higher education and maybe in our society at large, we've been very interested in generative AI, especially in the last year and a half, uh, when most famously ChatGPT became available to the public in the fall of 2022. And we've been fortunate enough to be able to get some research projects started since then to help us better understand the impact of this technology uh, on the learning experience in higher ed, both as an instrument for facilitating learning, but also investigating some uh, other maybe less obvious uh, implications uh, of its usage in the higher education context. So we're gonna hear about one of those projects a bit later today during the panel. But first we are going to hear from an expert on large language models, which is the technology that underlies tools like ChatGPT. Uh, and joining us for that purpose, we have uh, Professor Kathy McEwen of the Department of Computer Science here at Columbia. And as I mentioned, Professor McEwen, uh, her research and her expertise is on these large language models. So we're gonna hear from Professor McEwen about the state of the art of the technology and also get some of her thoughts on what the impact of this technology might be in higher education. So thanks very much for joining us, Professor McEwen, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Great, thanks, and thanks for having me. Um, so I am a professor in the computer science department. My research is on a natural language processing, and most of our research now, though not quite all, involves uh, large language models. In the fall, I taught a course on language generation and summarization using large language models. And for both of these, we're very interested in where they work well and where they don't. And I would say this is something that uh, the field is looking to, at too, in part because these models are not um, transparent. So I'm sure we've all seen one of the fun things for me when I'm teaching a course is that there are lots of articles about um, these large language models pretty much every day that relate to what we're doing in the course and that makes it fun. I'm not going to say much about how they work, but here's a, a overview diagram. Um, these models are pre-trained in an unsupervised fashion on um, massive amounts of data. Um, so GPT-3 was trained on a data set of 300 billion tokens of text, and its objective is uh, to predict the next word in a sentence. So for example, given a phrase like a robot must, um, it learns based on all of the data in its data set, what is the most likely next word. And this creates the model GPT-3, which then can be used um, out of the box. So first let's look at when it does well. Um, one kind of example is what we call open-ended generation. We give it a prompt. Here the prompt is describe what happened on January 6, 2020 in two paragraphs. And here it can keep to two paragraphs. If we gave a number of words, it would have a little bit of a harder time. Um, and it does well at providing fluent and, and um, very uh, objective text about uh, what happened during those days. So we get something like on January 6, 2020, a mob of supporters of then President Donald Trump stormed the United States Capitol building in Washington, D.C., during a joint session of Congress and so forth. So clear and um, follows the, the course of events of that day. Uh, my work, my research for years has been in summarization. And so we were 
interested in characterizing how well different language models could do on the news summarization task. So I'm not showing an input news article, uh, but I am showing in blue the summary generated um, by one a version of an open AI model, the zero shot instruct da Vinci model. This is GPT 3.5. Um, and this was the model that did the best on our in our experiment, we tested 10 models. Um, key to its success is that it's zero shot. It has no example input, uh, examples in its input, which could mislead it about how to do. And it uses reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, we experimented by having people judge how good the summaries were on a variety of parameters, coherence, um, how consistent the output is with the input, um, and so forth. And our research showed that um, generated summaries by this GPT 3.5 model were judged to be as good as summaries written by freelance writers. Um, so we concluded from this that news summarization is a solved problem in the field. And this is a view held by um, most people in the field. Yesterday, I attended a dissertation defense by a PhD student in the Department of Biomedical and Informatics, Griffin Adams, who's supervised by Noemi El Haddad. And he was working on uh, models for generating summaries of hospital notes. Um, so hospital notes, uh, there are many physicians who may make notes during a patient's stay in the hospital. These are done every day. Um, so the input to the model is quite a bit larger than in the case of news. Um, and on the discharge summary, when the patient is discharged, there is a short summary um, of the events that took place during the hospital stay. And shown here is a reference summary, so one um, a good summary by person uh, in a public data set. Um, so TLDR, uh, large language models out of the box don't do a great job at this. Um, why? Well, um, the vocabulary and the structure of the input is quite different from what they're trained on. And thank goodness, we wouldn't want them to have been trained on um, patient records in any way. Um, and the hospital note is quite a bit more complex. It's longer, it has a complicated temporal information, contradictions and re repetitions. Um, I note that uh, you should be concerned about putting private information into ChatGPT because the data is saved and used in its uh, training. Uh, but what Griffin found was that uh, smaller models that he could tailor by tr uh, fine tuning on the data in this domain uh, do do well, and he could address some of the problems that we're seeing. Question answer, for example, here's a question which might be useful to me if I was doing a project on new vaccines and I knew nothing about it. I might ask what kinds of areas of research are relevant um, and ChatGPT responds with several of them. Um, I wouldn't use this text in anything that I was writing, but it could help me know where to look more, to find more, what kind of reading to do. Um, these models work well in multimodal settings, um, and we're interested because we're looking at developing models that can um, provide interpretive descriptions of artwork. And so we thought we would check out how well do the current models do. They do surprisingly well. You can see here that the output tells us about a painting that portrays a group of figures. It gives some detail um, about what it sees uh, in the painting. So uh, this is descriptive, um, but it's again, fairly well written. And if we look at the GPT-4 technical results, so new models are coming out all the time. They are generally larger and much better. There was a huge um, jump in performance with GPT-4 over GPT-3.5. 
0.5. And you can see on these exam results, it often scores almost 100%. For example, on the GRE verbal, um, it scores quite high. Okay, so what about when things go wrong? And if you're thinking about using it um, in teaching, you should know what kinds of things can go wrong. Uh, so this is an extreme example, but uh, it does illustrate some of the problems that large language models do have. They currently have problems with hallucinating things which are not true and in general with um, truthfulness. This was a model that was developed uh, a couple of years ago, Galactica, which was intended, it was trained on scientific text. And they were interested in, they put it up on the web and they were interested in seeing if people could use it to write reviews of scientific articles. Well, people tried it for all kinds of things. And as you can see with one of the things written here uh, for describing a study, here, the benefits of eating crushed glass. So uh, the purpose of the study was to find out if the benefits of eating crushed glass are due to the fiber content of the glass or to the calcium, magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus contained in the glass. And it goes on, it describes the study, which had 12 adult males um, and the meals that they ate. Uh, each subject had three test meals, the first one being 200 grams of crushed glass, 75 of which were food grade glass. Clearly, this is problematic. This model was quickly taken down, uh, but this is something that uh, people look at, for example, being able to detect when dangerous text has been written and placed online. Perhaps uh, a more difficult problem for research, um, I showed you this description of what happened on January 6th. It's very plausible. It's written so well, we find it easy to believe. And in fact, when we look at the last sentence, we find a problem. Here, it's telling us that um, this event prompted the impeachment of President Trump, and he was later convicted by the Senate becoming the first president in US history to be impeached twice. And when I read this, I thought, hmm, I didn't remember that he was convicted. And I actually had to look it up and I found out, yeah, no, he was not as I thought, but I was convinced by the text. And this is a problem of, for large language models. They can slip in these pieces of text that contain misinformation in the midst of a piece of text that's very well written and plausible. And this is one of the most difficult research problems that many places are working on right now. Um, well, we saw that news summarization we said was solved. So was my work on summarization done? Uh, we're now looking at a variety of other genres, and one that we were interested in was summarization of narrative. Here we can see the story um, as input, and the last part of the story, the point of the story, um, reveals to us that the narrator's mother was abusive. Uh, we tested many models, shown here the output from GPT 3.5, which you heard was the best on news. And here, um, the model has so much in its training data that biases it towards believing that mothers are good, that it misinterprets the point of the story and tells us that their mother still has plenty of wit and humor. And in fact, all of the models that we tested on this particular story concluded with some information about how good the mother was. Um, in this genre, our research benchmarking large language models um, shows that 70% of the summaries that are generated contains hallucinations. And perhaps more interesting, it reveals how difficult it is to evaluate output in this case, and we're looking at evaluation methodology. Um, going back to the question and answer case, if I were to follow up that slightly broader question with a natural follow-up, like what are some references on antigen design that I could read? 
Here, ChatGPT gladly gives me a reference, but if I check it, I find that the reference doesn't exist. And this is a common problem with these uh, models. In fact, you may have seen the article that appeared in the New York Times about the lawyer that used ChatGPT to um, write his, uh, his um, court filing. And it cited many cases, but when the judge looked them up, in fact, none of them existed. This, needless to say, was pr problematic for the lawyer who was um, fined uh, for his work. And that didn't stop people. We see that Michael um, Cohen's lawyer also used ChatGPT with a similar problem. Um, if we look more closely at the description of, um, the, of the image that came out, we find that although it's well-written and describes many aspects of the scene, it also gets uh, many of them wrong. So um, are they in classical attire? And the woman is wearing a blue, but not a red robe. And she's not holding a pillow with what appears to be a gift. So in sum, we can see that large language models produce impressive output uh, from generated text to summarization. Um, I did not talk about, but they do a good job on generating code and programs. Um, generate, generation of creative writing is a little uh, more iffy. Um, they're not always perfect. So definitely look closely at uh, what output is produced. Um, that said, they can be quite useful in a human in the loop mode. So if you're not planning to use it as full output, and but it prompts you and helps you in, in some way, it can be quite useful in that mode. Um, to close, in my class on large language models, they had a semester-long project. And for the proposal for the pr project, we asked them to use ChatGPT to write the related work section of the proposal and critique it. And then of course they had to write it themselves as well. Um, for the final project, we told them that we didn't think that ChatGPT or any other large language model would help them in writing it. But if they disagreed and thought it could help improve uh, their English, they're free to do that. But they had to turn in the version before submission to the large language model and after. Um, we would grade the version by the large language model, but they would be held responsible for any unnecessary deletions or changes that didn't reflect accurately the original paper. So it was a risk. Um, we also asked in our department how people are using um, large language model. And one faculty member noted that he's using it in a 4,000 level course um, to help generate in-class practice problems and questions. Um, these are never perfect and he doesn't use them as they are, but they help him to think about um, what might be some good questions and how to rephrase things. So it's a good example of human in the loop. Thanks. Thanks so much, Professor McEwen, for that overview and for sharing some of those examples of uh, how this technology might be used or should be used uh, in the educational context. As I mentioned, we'll have more time during the Q&A portion at the end of the panel today to explore uh, some of those contexts in more depth. Uh, but we're going to move on now to our second presentation. Uh, here we have a, a pair of Columbia uh, scholars who uh, received a joint grant from Solaire last spring. Uh, to study a very interesting question. So in this collaboration, we have Dr. Victoria Mullaney Brown, who is Columbia's Director for Academic Integrity, and uh, Chris Munsell, who is the Glasscock Associate Professor of Professional Practice of Real Estate Development Finance at the Graduate School of Architecture, Preservation, and Planning. And as I mentioned, the two, uh, th these two collaborated uh, on a, a SLAIR grant proposal, uh, which we funded and have been working together since last summer on a very intriguing project studying the use of generative AI, specifically large language models, in a course that uh, Professor Munsell teaches. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Melanie Brown and Professor Munsell. Thanks for joining us. We're here to talk today about our study, as well as um, some of the some of the preliminary findings we found as ChatGPT's application in the classroom. 
Uh, we wanted to start with with talking about the genesis of this um, project. I think you know one thing I communicate to my students very often um, is the power in networking and taking advantage of of opportunities. Um, so this really kind of began, at least for me, with the Center for Teaching and Learning. I did the Active uh, Learning Institute in the summer of 2020, uh, which was a very immersive experience for myself. In fact, actually in the um, class we conducted this uh, study was uh, the class that I used as a, as a framework to reconstruct certain um, learning objectives. Continuing with some of the programming for from the Center for Teaching and um, Learning, I uh, was able to get to know a um, uh, person at the at the center um, who was able to make the the introduction uh, to myself and Victoria as I was looking to increase my school service, and that's where I joined the Academic Integrity uh, Working Group at Columbia, and uh, that's where I met Victoria. Great. Um, so a lot of what Chris is sharing with you, Professor Mansell is sharing with you, is that academic integrity referral working group. So I work with uh, faculty and administrators uh, monthly, and we get together to talk about issues related to the student experience, to policy and practice. But when it came to this project, uh, the natural collaboration um, emerged. I work to support Columbia College and Columbia Engineering, uh, specifically our undergraduates, yet Chris works with graduate students in the school of GSAP. So the natural collaboration between us being interdisciplinary, as well as this new partnership, we developed a really good rapport. And that was what's naturally led us to kind of think about how do the work that I do at the university around how does integrity apply ethically to some of these large language models in the learning and um, space, you know, how could we develop a research project that would look at and covering initially some results on that? So, you know, we uh, work to continue to think about this project deeper, and we connected with Adam and the Solaire team to put together a grant. Thanks, Victoria. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my background. Uh, so as Adam uh, mentioned, I'm the Glasscock Associate Professor of Real Estate Development um, Finance. I teach uh, more specifically in the MS in real estate development program at GSAP. The bulk of my curriculum is uh, is the core real estate finance curriculum, which comprises, uh, at least for my teaching role, two courses in the fall, uh, one in the spring, as well as an advanced placement uh, elective. And I had a little bit of a non-traditional route to academia. I have about 15 years professional experience Um in the real estate industry, largely focused on uh, capital structure and lending. Uh, and actually, after after doing the program and then uh, doing research, my my role kind of emerged and evolved. So I focus a lot on the application of theory to practice, uh, as well as bringing uh, practice to the classroom. Great. And in my role um, for Columbia College and Columbia Engineering undergraduates, my role evolved as the inaugural director for academic integrity, and I started at the university in 2018 in January. And since then, I've continued in this role um, and developed uh, academic integrity program for undergraduates to reflect and learn. And when they make mistakes on academic misconduct, how do we learn and grow from that? But I took this collaboration as a unique way to collaborate between the schools, as well as an opportunity to learn more about what Chris was naming the theory to practice, right? Um, there's a whole discipline in educational research focused on academic integrity. And I wanted to also think about how can we use ChatGPT as a measure of understanding student attitudes towards learning. And so combined with our two different roles, I sit in the administration um, and Chris in the faculty, you know, this became a good partnership to try out what we could learn from this research study. And I would just uh, echo um, Victoria's thoughts there, especially discussing earlier, you know, when um, you're you're able to communicate across a few different levels and you you find people that you get along with and work with well, it's really the constant idea uh, collaboration um, and really kind of how this this grant came about, the opportunity for um, 
for the overlap of ideas, I think is what made it exciting and is especially uh, is especially re relevant. So I want to talk a little bit about the study. Um, so there in the MS and real estate development program, it's a three semester, uh, one year full time program. Um, it starts in the summer, ends in the um, in the spring, and in their second core uh, semester, they take real estate finance too, uh, which specifically focuses on the capitalization of both the debt and equity sides of a real estate development project. The course ranges from about a little over 100 folks to um, maybe around 175 folks, 150 or so on average. And as you can imagine, it's a great opportunity to get a lot of diverse viewpoints, but at the same time, it's uh, very challenging because you've got a very large audience. Um, so you have to find learning methods that uh, cater to a wide array of experiences and skill sets. And that was uh, some of what the Active Learning Institute um, at the Center for Teaching and Learning was, was so helpful. One of the key concepts of this study or of the, um, of the course is the joint venture waterfall. And what you have to know about the joint venture waterfall is it's an advanced calculation that essentially determines the allocation of profits between a real estate developer, so someone who finds a vacant site of land, puts a building on it, develops it, either holds it or sells it in their investors. Um, there are a lot of different inputs that can change the distribution of, of cash flow uh, at, at various times. In order to um, become very proficient in this, you have to understand the time value of money. And specifically with the joint venture waterfall, it requires a very advanced understanding of um, financial theory. And what I had noticed about a few years ago was that we, a lot of um, business schools and other finance related curriculum would stopped teaching the um, raw math uh, that, that was required to do finance and, and were relying specifically on Microsoft Excel. And while most of our graduates will use Microsoft Excel exclusively in the professional world, I started to notice that while they were very proficient with some of the functions, they couldn't necessarily spot errors um, in the financial models that they built. And I realized that because so many um, financial courses removed some of the basics of financial theory saying, hey, you're going to use Excel every day. So let's just teach you the end result. A lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge was missed there. And then a few years ago, I went back to teaching uh, more manual methods, starting with the algebra uh, and then continuing on to Excel. And I noticed that the overall learning improved. So that was kind of what we were thinking of when, when we were approaching this study is that while something like uh, ChatGPT can be very helpful as an aid, and to Kathy's point as well, you still have to be able to use it, use a, you know, a calculator or, or an aid to work back through and understand where it went wrong. Um, and that's why I think you know some part of our hypothesis was that this large language model might be helpful in helping you to get a task done, but you might miss some of the required knowledge. So we, um, the study was set up by taking a traditional homework assignment they would complete in any semester. Um, and we split the students that, or the participants into two groups. One group uh, would have the opportunity to use ChatGPT as an, in an unlimited fashion uh, to help with their homework. And the other group of students uh, could, could not use ChatGPT. And I think this is also worth knowing is that especially um, with the greater integration of technology, students rely a lot more on external aids. And that can be any, anything from, you know, third party websites or uh, as, as basic as, you know, YouTube videos. Um, so it's very important to understand that while it's important in the ac academic sphere, both in the professional sphere, students will, if they run into an issue, let's say in their career, might be uh, relying on the same resource. And so if they either can't spot errors in the data or know some of the pitfalls of some of the technologies out there, they're going to rely on these technologies 
potentially to make investment decisions, um, which, which could create a lot of challenge for them down the road. So our first research question is how effective ChatGPT is an out, as an outside teaching students um, how to use Microsoft Excel for the joint venture waterfall. So that's kind of the first question, i.e. how helpful is this large language model and helping them get a task done? And then the second research question is, well, how much did they learn uh, throughout the process? And our hypothesis in the first question uh, was that maybe ChatGPT could get them to do the task more effectively because they just have the classroom instruction, uh, the non-ChatGPT group. The ChatGPT group has this resource that they can use for, they, they can ask an unlimited amount of questions. And some of the definitional responses that ChatGPT gets are quite accurate. Um, what we found, though, is on average, um, students who did not, who received traditional classroom instruction and did not use ChatGPT performed about 11% better than the group that could use ChatGPT in an unlimited fashion. And then what really confirmed our hypothesis were the results uh, for our second research question was that we gave them a learning assessment that was uh, extracted from uh, the final exam. Uh, and these questions were centered around the learning objectives that the assignment covers. It was a multiple choice assessment, took maybe 15 minutes or so in class. And on average, the uh, student group that did not have the use of ChatGBT performed 26% better. So almost a, so more than a quarter um, better than the group who had the use of the aid. And I think what's important about these results is that it, especially in today's um, society where I think students are increasingly critical of instruction, you can't necessarily say, hey, don't use ChatGBT because it's not permitted. I think it's more helpful to show them, hey, if you use ChatGPT, here's, especially in the professional world, here's where it can maybe help you, but understand that if you rely on this exclusively, you're gonna miss X, Y, and Z. And as, and as Kathy mentioned earlier, sometimes it gets most of the required assignment or data set that you need, but it's just that tiny bit that's not very, very obvious that it gets incorrect, which especially when making deficient, uh, Investment is decisions can be especially punitive. So I'll let Victoria here talk about our, our third research question. So in our, our last research question, uh, we talked at length about how does this connect to um, students and ethical decision making? So the question that we came up with was how do students self-reflection on the use of ChatGPT using Microsoft Excel demonstrate their awareness of their own critical thinking and theory application in real estate? and ethical decision-making in the course. So in alignment with what uh, Chris has shared with the sense of how do we teach students to make sure that they can spot critical errors, um, that's what we were looking for. And, and for the work that you know I consistently do in my practice, it's all about talking about ethical decision-making. Why do you make one choice over another? So as Chris mentioned in the previous slide about the research of the study overview, this was a mixed method study uh, and approach, and it was really important for us to uncover both quantitative and qualitative data. And so uh, in my look at the work, uh, we did a focus group, and I wanna thank uh, PhD student Connor Martini, who's also a Solaire graduate assistant. He facilitated a focus group um, after the quantitative data was, um, was given. And what we found out, we had 60 students total uh, that participated in the study. And out of that, 11 students participated in the focus group. Um, there would have been 28 that were actually very interested in participating, but due to uh, scheduling, uh, 11 participated. So about 50% of the students in the overall study group participated. Um, and what we found out about from what students were saying about their learning and, and their observations of the models, is that they spoke about a range of different generative AI tools, which didn't include the obvious chat GPT. They also brought into their um, conversations other models like Claude, for example, which was a new one for me. And I've, I've tried my best to keep up on some of these large language models. But as you know, the technology keeps shifting and changing. New companies are evolving. 
Um, but they also, students really remarked a lot in the focus group, specifically confusion on prompting. And so what you saw with Professor McEwen's um, research, very much there's still a lot of confusion for uh, students who are using said language uh, models. What do you actually input in order to get an output correctly? Like uh, there's a lot of going on about why they were confused about that. And in particular, what type of information is shared in the output. So they overall said that there's, there's this general sense that ChatGPT is not really a teaching tool, but almost like a private tutor is kind of what we heard in some of the larger themes of the focus group. And that it's almost like this hidden curriculum um, that students have this like baseline ability to do the assignment for this joint water uh, waterfall, venture waterfall, Right, but they have to develop trust at the same time in the learning process, which is what Chris was just talking about before, like trust in the the class environment that they're in. And so we talked at length about this other outcome to the focus group that students are saying it's okay with them, right? If some things of their learning objectives are being taken out of the curriculum. So if they can learn it on their own, because as you heard, they're using ChatGPT almost like a second study aid, but in a sense, there's this debate between curriculum and use of automation and the learning outcomes. And I think what's what's interesting in hearing about this is students are still rough, like grappling with their own self-reflection of how useful are these LLMs in doing a task at hand, right? How useful are they in being accurate and so they are still wrestling with that. What we did find though overwhelmingly in the study as Chris shared is that the students who didn't use ChatGPT overwhelmingly learned a lot more and were more accurate in what they shared if I didn't, in what they learned. So th those are some of the bigger um, outcomes from the focus group. In one thing I uh, just wanted to tack on to that was that I find, especially with um, younger students, with regard to trusting the learning process, when you innovate pedagogy, so, as, or especially if you um, are approaching a learn, learning objective in a unique way, um, let's say, you know, either not including slides, maybe not using a third party textbook, um, if it's unfamiliar to students, a lot of times they will have a um, a harder time, but through some of the methodologies uh, developed actually with uh, from the Active Learning Institute, um, we created this sequential curriculum. And while it initially seems very unfamiliar um, to some students, they if you just encourage them and you are supportive and ask them to challenge themselves by at least trusting the process in the beginning, you will see that they actually learn um, a lot more. And that's been evident as, as curriculums iterated, you know, with the same assessments through time. So, you know, Victoria's point, especially about trusting the learning process, I think is uh, a unique challenge that I, I do see in, in, uh, in greater numbers um, with, with younger students. And so just to kind of summarize on some pieces on academic integrity and learning and think about how this applies to the context of um, academia, as well as just where we're at situated here at Columbia. So what have we learned from this study in particular? We, we know that critical thinking matters, right? Uh, I think this time last year, there was a lot of hysteria about, you know, how potentially these LLMs could be taking all of our jobs, right? Or, you know, interrupting that so much that there were all these existential questions happening. Um, but what we have now seen over time and just a year has passed, right, that still human critical thinking matters, right, in the learning environment. Um, and so to follow that up, there were some new policy developments too. So over the summer in 2023, there was officially a new addition to our standards and discipline policy at the university. And it's called Unauthorized Use of Artificial Intelligence Tools. And um, if you're curious in learning more about that, the, the official definition 
is absent a clear statement from a course instructor granting permission, the use of generative artificial intelligence tools to complete an assignment or exam is prohibited. The unauthorized use of AI shall be treated similarly to an authorized assistance and or plagiarism. And so um, that's just a helpful note if you didn't know that that new um, edition came out, as well as uh, a new generative AI policy was just released from the Office of the Provost. If you're curious on reading that, it is a pretty lengthy text. Uh, there was a working group convened by the Provost Office, and uh, there's an email that I wanted to share here. If you want to provide any comments, you're welcome to do that. Um, and before I say the last bit, I just also wanted to say that um, the this grant was a really great opportunity to think about how interdisciplinary work, both from policy and practice, how does that connect? And then that's, uh, you know, the true essence of kind of the work that we do as, as educators. First and foremost, I think we think about our disciplines as single solitary things a lot of us are experts on, but we are educators in our work. And I think what's important to think about constantly is how do we continue to evolve and using a large language model in the classroom is, is another example of, of how you can kind of think more critically about maybe how I might change my pedagogy or teaching practice. Um, and the final thing I'll say is um, I help organize and create every year Integrity Week and coming up just this month, uh, at the very end of this month, February 26th to March 1st is Integrity Week. And I wanted just to plug that week. It's a week long series of programming that helps engage our campus community on these questions of, of integrity um, in the classroom and in our um, campus writ large. So I invite you to check out there are, uh, lots of different things for faculty, students and staff, including um, ongoing conversations about generative AI. Uh, one thing I wanted to add here on the thank you was I um, I wanted to thank uh, Jess King from uh, our program um, who gave me the introduction to the uh, to the Center for Teaching and Learning and then to John Fu um, who uh, who introduced me to uh, Victoria and to to Adam for for bearing with us um, throughout this throughout this entire process and with that. I think it's time for the Q&A. Thanks so much. Uh, it's so uh, refreshing to hear this very carefully thought out, uh, implemented study uh, being done thoughtfully during a time when there's so much just sort of background chatter about uh, about uh, anxieties about the impact of this technology in the, in the teaching and learning context. So great to see what we can what we can learn, uh, what we can discover when we uh, take things uh, with a thoughtful and and re and measured approach. Uh, so we have some remaining time to uh, go into Q&A now. We're going to take some questions from the audience. Uh, just to get things started, though, I wanted to turn to Professor McEwen. I'm curious about any new technology. I'm always wondering, are the limitations that you described in this case, do you think these are issues that will be addressed as the technology improves, limitations that may go away? Or are there more fundamental problems here that mean that we'll never really be able to solve the problem of hallucinations or uh, making up uh, references, uh, et cetera. Um, so this is a topic that, as I said, I think everybody is working on from companies to universities. Um, it's a hard problem. Um, let's, let's take the case when you're generating a summary, uh, whether it's factual or not, or, or faithful to the input, we can check the output summary facts against the input article. But if we're just generating a text about things in the world, you know, how do we know what's true in the world? So what do we check against? What kind of resource do we use to do checking? And, and that's, you know, one of the one of the big problems there. Um, things improve rapidly. So we've had rapid improvement with the different um, kinds of large language models. Uh, Claude, for example, is much better at the summary of narratives than is GPT-3 or GPT-4. Um, so we're definitely going to see improvement. Um, are, is it ever going to be always factual, entirely factual in every case? Um, that it could be a while before it's like that. 
Thanks for that. And on a related note, we have a, a question coming in here. Uh, how effective are tools that claim to detect text produced by AI models? This is a question that also has uh, some implications for academic integrity. So uh, I'm curious for your thoughts, Professor McEwen, and then we'll also turn it over to uh, Dr. Melanie Brown for her thoughts on this question of uh, the process of trying to detect AI-generated text. Uh, they're not very effective. Again, it's an open research problem. Um, I So OpenAI had a tool themselves to detect their own text, but they took it down because it's not uh, very accurate. Again, things change all the time. So uh, that was the case the last time I looked. I do know of research going on at University of Pennsylvania, which looks quite promising on detecting um, AI generated text, but nothing is there yet. Um, yeah. And I would say the same on using that in any type of investigative concepts. I mean, here at Columbia, um, the Center for Student Success and Intervention, they are the ones that typically are investigating academic misconduct. Of course, it really depends on the schools, how that's generated here. Um, but there have not been any reliable tools that you know, we could use in any way to determine whether a student actually used some kind of um, artificial intelligence in writing, for example, which tends to be the more common one um, for us, at least right now in reported cases of academic dishonesty. Um, but writ large, a lot of higher ed institutions aren't really relying on where on types of softwares, because there's lots, as you can imagine, lots of third party companies are marketing and like hawking, you know, <laughs> higher ed institutions like here, we've created this program that has detected artificial intelligence in writing. And so you have to be really careful. And I think that similar to what Professor McEwen is saying, there's no, um, you know, tech that has been really developed strongly that could give accurate results. I think I can continuing this same line of thinking, um, Jackie Dugard asked, for the humanities and social sciences, how do we get ahead of LLMs regarding essays? In other words, assuming there's actually no way to identify LLM, LLM usage, how do we structure essays so that they still test students' skills? Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who would like to address that, please go ahead. I think at least for um, assessments, I think you're still relatively shielded from chat GBT as we found, um, you know, in, in homework, it's, it's a challenge uh, and especially the kind of lack of a very accurate method to identify, um, you know, work produced by a large language model. When you're doing any type of assessment, as long as it's in person, um, you can still use, I use like a canvas for a lot of multiple choice testing which is still there, still in person. You can, can still control the test environment where if they did all their work in ChatGBT, again, they won't produce as high quality homework, but still pretty good, you know, uh, almost within 90%. But on the learning assessments, they're going to still fall very, very short. And specifically with essay writing, um, and what I feel we might be in a place today is that the blue book, uh, you know, might might come back in vogue. So if, if you're trying to teach mm -hmm. writing skills, right? which might be reflected in someone's essay, as long as this assessment is created, you know, in person in the blue book, where you can manage the control of that technology. Um, and maybe it's on campus, you know, where, where maybe you could block access to the website, whatever, what have you, you can still create the environment that, that confirms that, but maybe, you know, you won't be able to put as much of the assessment, um, you know, on uh, a, a kind of open-ended uh, electronic submission. So um, I'll add one of my collaborators is a linguist and she's always, you know, analyzing the writing that we're getting um, out of the large language models. And there, there are, you know, various kinds of things you can see. They tend to be on the vague side. Um, you, you may be able to tell a little bit in terms of um, the student's a uh, typical style versus the style now. I think the the vagueness is, um, you know, it will uh, 
would be the biggest giveaway as as you're looking at things. One one thing I would actually add on to what Kathy said. Um, my mom is a K through three special ed teacher. My sister is a eighth grade um, uh, English teacher, and she will say like through the high, knowing your students and getting the high volume, you can identify uh, work that that the that the computer's done, especially if it's um, out of character with the student. And even if it's not out of character of the student, by just seeing the volume, she understands, you know, the way that the computer conjugates, you know, um, a certain a certain word or the way it, it uses some clause is is something that's only generated by the um, the computer. Hardly, hardly foolproof, but um, there, you know, are some other ways that, that you can kind of bring it to your attention. And I know this might seem kind of like a, a, an interesting response, but I also think gut, like your gut reaction intuitively sometimes tells you a lot more than what um, any other measure is. So as you read something, something doesn't quite sit right with you. That's similarly what I tell faculty a lot of times, like if this doesn't quite seem right, like let's look into it a little bit more. Sometimes we can offer that as well. It's not a foolproof answer though. I'm sorry. <laughs> a lot of this work is like really complicated. Certainly. And and what I'm wondering about is, is it possible to critically examine and potentially move beyond the what seems to me the kind of dominant paradigm of these conversations where we're imagining this antagonistic relationship between students and instructors where students are trying to get away with whatever they can and instructors are trying to play defense or you know police those behaviors. So to what extent do we need or or how might we go about moving past that paradigm or trying to create a more collaborative uh, relationship uh, between students and instructors? I mean, I'm I'm thinking that something that comes to mind based on the study that that you that you told us about bringing in students to get their perspective in these kinds of focus groups may be one way of of uh, of of mitigating any negative effects of that kind of antagonistic. Uh, mindset, but I'm curious your your thoughts on that in general. I think uh, you know you probably brought up a good framework for the next grant, Adam. But there, um, you know, I think if you if you give everyone the use of ChatGPT, and then the assignment is to say where you know where did the resource misstep in its advice um, to you, uh, or or you know in some work that completed to you, because then. It, because to understand, just like in language, uh, to understand where the computer went wrong, you actually have to have quite an advanced knowledge. Um, because on the surface, a lot of the results that either you find on the internet or produced by ChatGPT, they don't necessarily obviously look incorrect. You know, maybe it's only to the trained um, eye or to the trained reader. So that could be the next iteration of it. It's like, okay, we're gonna, we taught you this concept, now ask the computer, um, these questions and, you know, tell me about five places uh, where, where they misled you or they produced an incorrect result. And then that, that familiarizes them with the technology and they can understand that if they encounter it in their professional careers, Hey, maybe it's good at, you know, creating some ideas or creating some bulk writing, but you've got to under, still understand this and parse through it to, you know, deliver an accurate product. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I mean, I felt like by the end of my class where it, it, having students critique what they're getting as output so that they spot the things which they don't like about what's being produced, they see the context in which it's not working well, um, certainly should help them understand where faculty will see through you know they're handing in something that has things that are not done well and that's actually in alignment with what has been already published there was a report from cornell about generative ai that came out not too long ago it's like a few months ago and one of the biggest outcomes from that was actually using um faculty embracing the use of chat gpt in some aspect of the learning for that critique for students to do that self critique of what the output was um so that they can critically think and that's really what came out of this joint study is thinking about how critical 
um, thinking still really is as much as we talk about it and don't glaze over it, like how much it really is a part of the work that we do as educators and as faculty and as you teach your students, getting them to think not just conceptually about the concepts, but how they interrelate and, and, and complicate it a lot more than that. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, one question, uh, one theme that came up in a couple of the Q and A questions was about potential pitfalls of becoming too narrowly focused on one particular tool. So uh, one one of the uh, uh, commenters pointed out that uh, maybe ChatGPT is already kind of going out of style among students that they're shifting their usage more towards this other tool called Claude. Or as Victoria mentioned, there's new new tools coming online all the time that that students may be using. So how do we how do we try to uh, manage that as we're investigating um, the utility of these tools in as a learning support or um, questions related to academic integrity? How can we engage in rigorous research? Um, but without becoming too narrowly focused on one technology in particular, or one tool in particular. I think one thing that you can do is if you have been students who believe in the learning process, uh, then they'll take your feedback about, you know, the use of any third party tool. I mean, think about, you know, YouTube in many regards is still much more helpful than a lot of the um, AI that's that's out there. Um, and it's frankly because, at least in my opinion, it's another human who can reach commonality with them um, and and teach a lesson in a in a different manner or module for. Um, but I think as long as students are engaged in the process, and you not just tell them that there's merit in um, in the learning process, but show them that there's merit in doing this, and it's not just you know for good grades or for a degree or what have you, but it it really is knowledge that's going to serve you, make you better at your job, um, you know, whatever you decide uh, from from your academic experience, and will also help them out in in their lives. You know, the constant pursuit of knowledge, and that these the all these other tools are just aids or to make your life easier. But there's there's really no no shortcut in life, and I think most, especially of the more experienced students come in with that knowledge. So I think the, the hurdles just communicating that to uh, maybe some of the younger folks who don't have as much experience. I don't think it's possible for faculty to be keeping up with, you know, yeah. all the changes and what the differences are between the tools. It happens very, very quickly, like in a, in a matter of months. Um, and I, I don't think that at this point, I don't think the differences are that large that you know, it would it would matter that much if 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 we saw things. I mean, maybe that would be a role for CTL if they saw things where there had been a dramatic change in um, you know what what capabilities that they could every six months produce like a summary of you know what people people should know. Um, or or be looking at. Um, I mean, right now, I think GPT four is the um, it, you know is the model that does the best and is um, quite impressive in in what it can do. Um, but yeah, it's going to change. Yeah, and I would agree with Professor McEwen on that. There's no way you can keep up with it um, by any means, and I think by student standards, the reasons why they're accessing more of this stuff online, like these length, large language models or any third party aid is really their intention is to get the best grade, right? And we know we have a lot of overachievers here at Columbia. So with that, it's more still related to your pedagogy and teaching practice around kind of what do you permit? I mean, even when we go back and look at the generative AI policy, it's goes back to you as the instructor. Like, are you allowing it? Are you not? How how clear is that? But it's still a evolving situation that I think it's it's still something that we have to just keep our eye on and, and kind of watch a little bit closer. Thanks so much, everyone. I hate to cut the conversation short, uh, but we, we do need to wrap up now. So I want to thank all of our panelists. And I would also like to thank all of my colleagues at the CTL for putting on this wonderful event. 
Uh, that's all for today. Of course, if you want to learn more about these research projects and our work in Solaire, you can email solaire at columbia.edu. And uh, thanks for your attention today, and please enjoy the rest of the symposium.